call the meeting to order. First on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Is there any amendments? Move to approve as printed. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. So I will just tell you, you may have a lag between um, you may have a lag between the ATV club or no, you won't for June GMP because Tiana is here. So um, and recreation committee can't has certain members can't come till seven. So but Tiana is here. Tiana, are you expecting anyone else? I did invite others, um, okay. but I, I think it probably might just be me tonight. But if okay, others thanks. come in, it, yeah. Okay, perfect. So if we may get to you a little bit ahead of time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Who yep. is representing ATV club? Richard Manning okay. and Ray Blakeney. I'm not sure who else is here for the ATV club. Uh, okay. Cecil Lockwood and he as well. Okay. We'll let you guys go first then. How's that? Sounds good. <laughs> uh, we're just here again this evening to seek permission from the town to be able to use uh, town roads again. They connect all of the private land ATV trails that we have in place. Um, new club that's been formed here in Bethel with local residents again. And this, so kind of to relieve the Stockbridge guys and let them take care of their area. So we're just looking to follow up and have continued permission. So the map is on file mm -hmm. as it is usually. And so like you said, that Bethel's forming their own club. Did you used to have your own club in Bethel before Quad Runners? Yes, you saw? I believe originally years ago, the club did originate in Bethel and for yeah. some reason it migrated yeah. to uh, to Stockbridge. All right, Cecil's nodding his head behind you, yeah. So the map is on file. They're not asking for any changes at this time mm -hmm. and uh, they're gonna reach out to Alex Reister so that they can be, you know, talk to someone from Bast and, and um, but the map's on file, so they're not asking for any changes, just change of people running it. And we know where to find Richard <laughs> every day. <laughs> so if there's a problem, we know how to track him down. Have we had any issues with any of the four-wheeler no. activity? I haven't heard anything. So. No, not Pete. Okay. They're always good stewards. All right. Any comments or questions from the board? Or if not, just need a motion to approve the Bethel ATV Club's annual request to use the existing roads per the map that's on file. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. One question. Oh. <laughs> got you rolling too fast. <laughs> we're gonna get I you said you had a question. We're going to get you a stick. Yeah, and immediately. <laughs> sure we're here to. be ready. <laughs> uh, to use the uh, VASA trails, everybody has to be registered with the state now? Yep, registered okay. with the state. Um, signed up with your local ATV club, and you also have to have insurance on your machine. Same thing as the storm, does it? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And the helmet law now as well, yep. Oh, good. Well, that's not a bad idea. Insurance also. Sounds good. Great. Right. That was painless. Yeah. <laughs> See you next year. That's right. That's pretty much the way it goes. All right. Well, uh, while we're waiting for the 6.30 appointment that we'll probably still get to early, I would just suggest that we just go through the appointments quickly. We should be able to go through that yeah. within five minutes or so. I will tell you that I, we did receive confirmation from all these people, but as it's a stack of paper, I didn't really think you needed to specifically see every single one of them. So, but we did receive, um, obviously they all agreed to do this. We're not appointing anyone without their knowledge. They all agreed. Would you like individual emotions or would you like to just read down through them and then we'll make one big yeah. motion? Yeah, um, last year we did, Lindley did one big motion. I happen to okay. look back to see how you did it last year so I could word it the same. So yeah, we just, one motion is fine. I got a question. I, yeah. I know everybody on there except this Melanie Davis. Is she Melanie? That's Melanie awkward. Davis. That's that, her daughter. That's her daughter? yeah, yeah okay. and she's a licensed nursing assistant, and I believe she's going on to school. Yeah. Yep. Yep. No, no, I don't know about that Jean Krause character. I know. I question him all the time, but you know, he volunteered, and uh, Call Valley <laughs> did agree. Order. 
the hail out of learning. He was yep. a warm body. We and, just figured throw him in there. That's right. And Paul agreed to be the alternate. He was the original appointment, <clears throat> so which is nice. So it's kind of him. Anything else you want to volunteer for tonight, Paul? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any any other discussion in regards to the appointments listed? Move to appoint that whole list of positions as they are printed. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. And those appointments are done. GMP could take a minute. You might want to start early if she's willing to go along. Sure. So you ready on the GMP thing side of things? You guys ready to do your thing? Okay. Um, uh, okay if I share my screen with the presentation? Okay, let me try. <laughs> What? I'm not gonna I, oh, I think I think I can do it. Oh, cool. All right. Oh. I thought I had to give you permission. No, you're right. You do. It says host All disabled right. participant. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. All right. Let me figure it out. Um, I don't know. I'll just let you. Who can share? All participants. Um, I don't care. I think that. Should, hopefully, that does it. Yep. That's perfect. Oh, good. So I did just to say, Tiana, I did put in the packet um, some information from the conversation that I had with Maddie. Um, yeah. Just saying that what I said was that someone would be here from GMP and that GMP has the opportunity to apply for a $19 million grant from the federal government. And GMP has a cost share. Uh, the town of Bethel would not. If the grant is awarded, GMP will create a plan to increase the resiliency in our electric grid and aim for reducing outages to zero. It will be achieved via several avenues, underground power lines, moving lines closer to the road, tree trimming, removal near lines, uh, uh, residential battery storage, possibly larger battery storage, a microgrid for the downtown. The plan is to break up Bethel into four zones, tailor different approaches to different zones. Uh, the cost to residents would also be zero, as GMP will pay for the residential batteries and create a process to dispose of and replace the battery after its 10-year life cycle. In 10 years, there may be a cost to the home motor, but at this time, that's unknown. And I just said, as you can imagine, um, from an emergency management perspective, this would be a good opportunity. So hang on. Um, I, I think that's the whole presentation. I think well, I just wanted you to correct anything that I did wrong, that I oh. misspoke, so. No, that's great. I, that's um, and I do, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Maddie uh, murray Clausen is the project manager on this, and that's who has been um, in touch with you. Uh, yep. But I am here tonight. Um, Maddie and I work closely together. I'm head of electrification and sustainability for GMP. And um, yeah, really excited about a lot of our work around resiliency zones and especially this opportunity here in Bethel. Um, I know with the, the this has been a very, very rough winter, um, especially for um, central and southern parts of Vermont. And so it feels like a timely uh, time to be talking about it. Um, and again, we've we've seen three of our top five worst storms in 40 years in this winter. Um, so so good time to be talking about it and happy to answer any questions that you have. So a couple years ago, um, in anticipation of what we knew was going to be coming with, uh, with weather events and with climate events, um, we put together a climate plan. And that climate plan really targeted various initiatives, and you talked about them a little bit with those four zones, um, in order to strengthen our grid. And that includes undergrounding, so taking our, um, our lines that are above ground, putting them underground, installing um, Insul we have insulated water wire, but storm hardening our wires. So it's sort of a steel casing that sits on top of the wires that catches trees, catches branches um, in places where we won't be able to underground. 
Um, and then, um, you know, of course, replacing poles, making sure that those um, poles that haven't been replaced in many years uh, are, are upgraded and replaced, and then adding residential uh, energy storage in the form of batteries. You may have heard of Tesla power walls. There's all, um, there are other types of, of battery energy storage as well inside people's homes to provide that resiliency uh, there in your home should, should power go out. Um, we're really looking, the focus of that plan was to prevent outages and help us um, recover more quickly. So we know that these events aren't going to be changing. They're not lessening, they're getting worse. Um, what we want is for our customers to feel, you know, little to, to no impact um, when these storms come in, because we've done all of these things to really strengthen the grid. Um, and, uh, and so a big part of that is, is a faster timeline for implementing these strategies and something we're called res uh, something that we're calling resiliency zones, um, of which Bethel, Bethel would be one of them. Let me just, oops, there we go. So, so you may be asking yourself, what is a resiliency zone? Uh, it's a community hub that stays connected even when severe weather hits. So something like the storm that happened um, over, over the holidays and then um, this, this most recent one that we just had, uh, the poles may go down, wires may go down um, and things like that, but, but you would not experience outages happening. And that's again, because of those strategies in terms of undergrounding, um, moving wires where needed, replacing poles, and then having that, um, that resiliency within the homes in the form of batteries. Um, in some places, we're looking to install solar along with that and microgrids. I'll talk a little bit about that um, with respect to Bethel as well. Um, we have one right now in Panton, um, first of its kind solar microgrid that can completely island and and like disappear from the grid uh, or be an asset to the grid um, if needed. Uh, and we, it, they're really custom plans that we we work on in partnership with various communities. The climate plan outlines that we were going to do three a year. We've done uh, Grafton. We've done one in Grafton. We're working on um, uh, one in Brattleboro, and then we're also um, doing one in Rochester. And then we have this opportunity with this federal funding to do one in Bethel as well. So what Bethel's will look like is really, um, it's it's a plan that's tailored to your community there, hopefully in partnership with, with your community. And what I mean by that, you know, um, as was already shared, there's there's no cost to the community. This is this will be funded by GMP as well as uh, through federal funds. Um, when I say partnering with the community, you know, there are places where we want to think about, you know, um, sitting down and understanding what the community's needs are uh, and looking at circuit enhancement, storm hardening for all of Bethel so, so you can stay powered up. It would include a microgrid that would be both at the fire station as well as the local high school. Um, and then I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and uh, But that would be a place that, again, just, you know, stays up can turn off from the grid, can turn on and be an asset to the grid, and then installing home batteries as well. Um, the really nice part about all of these resiliency zones is that it reduces costs for all GMP customers. And the reason for that, and people don't often know this, but GMP does not make money off of the kilowatt hours that we sell. So the electrons going to your homes, we don't make money off of that. We make money off of capital improvements that we make to our system. Um, so when more people are electrifying, when we have more battery energy storage and we have more local renewables and we don't have to go out to the grid or go out to, to the larger grid and purchase energy when, when we're using the most and when it's the dirtiest and the most costly, that reduces costs for all of our customers. And then of course, reduces carbon emissions as well. When you said the fire station and the school, did you, I want to make sure I got that. Did you say they'd be on separate microgrids? Did you say? Yeah, so we would make a, what we would do there is a separate microgrid. Okay. Um, and so what that means is it, it would have its own large battery energy storage between those two facilities. Um, okay, and thank you. 
we have, yeah, we have like little batteries that would be in individual homes, but those two areas, because again, those are spots where, you know, during an emergency, something like Irene, and I, I know Bethel was hit really hard during Eileen, Irene, um, that would be a space that could serve as sort of an emergency shelter that would always be on because of this large battery energy storage. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I had that right for my notes. Thank you. Are you going to do a, a little Q&A afterwards here? Yeah, or I'm happy to answer now as well if it, if it, whatever you think is best. Well, you, you talked about strengthening uh, the uh, grid. What about increasing capacity? Where everybody and his brother is talking about uh, uh, yeah. electric everything, and uh, I'm a electrician, and I happen to be pretty confident that we can't do that with the grid that we have. Um, I know I've talked to the boys on line crew, and at one time you guys were talking about 34,000 primary or maybe even more. Uh, have you, are you thinking about doing anything like that? And if so, can you put that underground? So yes, the plan would be that that would be in fact underground. We do something um, every three years. It's an updated 20 year outlook for what we need and what we're anticipating will happen around um, our our resources and what's needed. So we have modeled the electrification, including, you know, when you look at the state's um, uh, energy plan and all of the, the cold climate heat pumps, all of the electric vehicles, all of the transformers needed to upgrade, we feel really confident um, in the contracts that we have that not only can we um, not only can the grid handle it from the from a capacity standpoint, but it will also be by 2030 hundred percent renewable. So when you're talking about those microgrids, what have you, have you got a plan for large users, say uh, Nolato or the grain store or places like that that have a lot of heavy electric use? Yeah, so um, I don't know specifically around those customers. That's something that I would need, uh, and and Maddie can follow up with you on those particular large users. But the plan is that it's for all of Bethel, um, and so the micro grid specifically is around. At this point, it was it was sort of posited around the high school as well as the fire station. But if we wanted to create another micro grid where we looked at the large businesses, that's something that we could do as well. Um, that's that's a big part of this initial outreach is is to sit down um, with community leaders and find out exactly what those needs are. Um, and, uh, you know, this application to the feds uh, is really just saying, you know, conceptually, we understand what the what the grid opportunities are here in Bethel. This is what we'd like to do. But in order to tailor that custom plan, we really want to sit down with you all in the community to decide what what those needs are. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before I? Yeah. Uh, I'm over here. I don't know if you can see. Anyway, we have, uh, you're going to put, if you put batteries in these homes, uh, two questions. One uh, is, will the customer then be charged for the electricity required to charge that battery or keep it charged? Uh, and I'm assuming, will that be a two-way wall or? Yeah. So that is exactly, um, that is exactly the way that it works. Um, the customer would pay for the electrons to charge up the battery, but then when right. GMP draws off of the battery, we would be crediting the customer. And when the customer is using the kilowatt hours that are in the battery, they're not they're not paying for that because it's already been paid for. All right. Does and, that make, make sense that it, it essentially nets out? Okay. And are those lithium batteries? They are. Is there any work being done to uh, mine the lithium from spent batteries? Yeah, so um, we are, that, that's kind of with our current power wall programs, that's part of what happens with both with electric vehicles and then also with these home batteries is that at the end of the battery's life, 
um, or what you consider the life or what it's doing inside the home, there's still a lot of life left in the batteries, the electric vehicle batteries, as well as the home batteries. And so <clears throat> what is happening to those now is that they're being sort of um, aggregated together, put together, and then they end up in large battery energy storage because there's still a lot of life left from that. Um, there are six recycling facilities in the U.S. right now um, that can take these batteries and um, and recycle and sort of um, responsibly dispose of the um, the uh, rare minerals that are inside of them. Um, but the batteries are lasting a lot longer than than what people even you know, originally expected, like the electric vehicle batteries are lasting up to 500,000 miles. And so um, the that sort of concern of the end of life of battery and what to do with it at the end um, is uh, they're, they're being able to be reused. Uh, that's good. Thank you. I, I'm concerned about lithium mining. Yeah, I know. Concern, and it's something that we are also um, looking into, I think, without sort of going too much down a rabbit hole. I think that right. the Inflation Reduction Act and a lot of what they're doing with um, making sure that the batteries are manufactured and assembled and all of that in the U.S. is going to be helpful in developing that industry and making sure that it's done more responsibly. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions before I go on to my next slide? Okay, so um, this map is uh, is our circuit map there in Bethel, and we've broken it into those four zones um, that Teresa was mentioning earlier. So zone one, two, three, and four. Um, and there's a lot that sort of goes into this, but what we've done and the way we've sort of determined this is by <clears throat> distance from the substation, you know, um, how uh, uh, how close it may be to roadways, um, and then also um, looking at things like vegetation and um, and then where it's sort of furthest away from the substation and having the most outages. So you you see it there in kind of the hot pink, the zone four, those are customers in, in Bethel that really experience the most outages. That's where we would be installing the home batteries. Um, so across this entire circuit, there would be a mixture of storm hardening. So that's what I mentioned about the steel casing that goes sort of above the, the lines, catches the trees, allows us to go remove the trees before they actually damage them. Um, we would be undergrounding um, and relocating various wires for resiliency. Um, again, that microgrid would serve the emergency shelter and fire station, the emergency shelter being the high school. Um, battery storage would uh, exist for, in homes and businesses. And then um, another part of this uh, project is um, using the latest technology to target and remove hazardous trees before they fall. Um, so we have our tree trimming program and, and we do a lot around vegetation management. This is um, a new sort of technology that you know, looks and overlays, understands where outages have been before and really targets and says, you need to go in and remove these trees even before sort of the routine of when we normally do the tree trimming. Um, sharing a little bit about the timeline once awarded, because you may be thinking like, how does all this happen? When when would this happen? Year one um, is is kind of the year that we're in, right? So we had we've had a couple of application periods. The second one is coming up um, here in the next uh, week or so. Um, year one is really about outreach to you all. Um, stakeholders surrounding um, businesses, residents, chill customers, all of that to talk about your priorities and needs. Um, and then storm hardening the lines, um, we would complete those in zone one. So back to this, it would be that sort of red zone that you can see right there in the middle. That's the main line um, that would be storm hardened the first year. Year two, we would be deploying that innovation to remove the hazardous trees, storm hardening the lines completed in zone two. So back to this map, zone two is those dark blue lines. So it's just sort of building upon the storm hardening that happened um, initially and um, and then uh, so storm hardening completed in zone zone two. 
Year three, we would be relocating lines to roadside um, at completed in zone three, undergrounding lines in zone three, storm hardening the remaining overhead lines completed in zone three. So what that means is it's like, okay, we're doing, we're, we're undergrounding most of those lines, but if we got to a place where there was a lot of ledge or some sort of reason why we still needed to have a pole that sort of, you know, it would underground, but come up out of a pole. Um, we would still storm harden those lines as well. And so back to this map again, zone three, that's the sort of lime green lines that you see there. And then year four is the microgrid with the island capability is online. And what I mean by the island capability is that it truly can be a complete asset to the grid. So it can sort of help us, you know, when we have a lot of um, solar during the day and um, we need to sort of dump that in a, in a particular place or or um, or take that off of the grid, that would allow us to do it. It can sort of blink off from the grid completely, disconnect from the, the broader grid and just exist on its own um, and has the complete ability to island um, on, that, uh, on that part of the circuit. Then all zone four customers in year four would have the behind the beat meter battery installed. So that's like the Tesla power walls. There's also Generac. There's also Enphase, um, large batteries that end up in your garage or in your basement um, that provide um, the same sort of backup that like a generator would. Um, and they're charged up. Um, GMP is able to draw off of those batteries during times of peak. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the benefit to the grid and the benefit to all of the customers as well, because we don't have to go out and buy that really expensive energy during that time. Um, but the primary thing you have it, uh, that customers have it for is obviously for backup should, should they lose power. And then year five, all the behind the meter batteries would be installed in the, the zone four, um, integrated with our distributed energy resource management solution. So that's just what I'm talking about with the sort of like pulling on the grid and pulling off the grid. Um, and then uh, we would show the, the microgrid islanding there as well in year five. Um, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty intensive project, the microgrid um, with the islanding capability. And so that would be fully functional by year five. And if I just go back to that uh, this map again, you can see the zone four, those are the hot pink lines. That's where the home batteries would be. Again, this is all um, at this point, you know, um, it's, it is, uh, it's more than conceptual because we're applying to the, the Department of Energy and saying, we've studied these circuits. We think that these are the best solutions. We also are able to tailor and update this, you know, again, based on sitting down with you all and understanding um, what your concerns are and, and how you, you want to be thinking about this, especially from an equity lens um, to make sure that um, income um, sensitive folks are, are taken into consideration with this and, um, and, and things like that. So you're looking for a letter of support from the select board as well as two rivers to um, submit with your application? Sure, so that's that's my next slide, next steps. Um, we are meeting with the energy committee tomorrow. We would love a letter of support from the town. Um, and then uh, should we receive this award, which we feel very confident <laughs> um, and being able to do, it would be announced in late summer. And that's Matt, that's Maddie's contact information, although I'm happy to share mine as well. Um, I am one of, I'm going to stop sharing if that's okay with everyone so yeah. I can see the pieces again. Mm -hmm. um, I am one of the people that during storm restoration um, works with towns and uh, emergency managers to, to keep people up to date. And so i um, happy to share my uh, information as well um, and, and excited to work with you all and get to know Bethel better um, through this process too. So once the award is in then, and it's awarded, Bethel is it. So did you get money like this for Rochester, Panton, no. and then the other towns? We didn't. This is the first application you're doing from yes. for the from the feds? Yeah. Yep. Just curious. Yep. Can you share your, your slides? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I could barely see them. Yeah, you could just email it to me. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, just email it to me, Tian, and I'll forward it to the select board. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. 
other questions, and I'm also happy to answer broader questions about GMP too, since I'm here, if you want to talk about storm stuff or you want to just anything at all, um, anything around uh, the resiliency zone. Yeah, and I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just, I really appreciate how forward thinking GMP is being about this. I think that's, you know, it's, it's positive. And I also appreciate that Bethel is kind of given this opportunity to be a part of this. And I'm kind of curious to see where it goes, not just within Bethel, but sort of the broader scope of how, how this plays out. Um, you, you noted that you kind of want not just town buy-in, but kind of the, the concept of working with the community to yeah. um, kind of develop the plan further. And I'm curious what that looks like from your perspective. Like yeah. how, how do we get a say? How is equity included? How are we yeah. weighing in with what our needs or mm. you know, boots on the ground perspective yeah. is versus a theoretical from an office? So that actually is my role within this project. And I, um, I'm originally from Fort Collins, Colorado, and I worked for the city of Fort Collins there for 15 years. And my role there was community engagement. And so a lot of um, public engagement, a lot of outreach and, and um, facilitation around decision making and how to figure these kinds of things out. And so um, I think it would be, I, I want to make sure that we do it in a way that works for your town and isn't sort of a heavy lift, but I would love to facilitate workshops um, to figure out how, you know, and some of the strategies we used in Grafton were really about going to people's homes and meeting people where they live um, and hosting, you know, town halls, going to the high school, like a, it would be a variety of different strategies to make sure that we're hearing the voice of those that are going to be impacted, um, as well as sort of the business community. So identifying who those stakeholders are first, working with you all to do that, um, and then really coming up with a targeted plan for each of the stakeholder groups to understand what those needs are, um, take all of those into account. Um, the equity and inclusion piece of this is incredibly important to us as well as to the DOE. Um, so we would want to be um, looking at it through that lens. And we have um, we have support that we have uh, that we work with here at um, GMP that can help us with um, that DEI lens. Great, thank you. And so I, I know that that's kind of vague, but we are putting a lot of thought into what that plan would look like. You know, and I understand, like I doing community organizing is is often vague at the outset. Um, <laughs> and I would sort of follow that up with maybe more a comment to fellow select board members, which is that if we choose to go down this path, that maybe we look at a way to assist GMP in this process in that we already have an, an equity and inclusion committee, we already have an energy committee, and that maybe we're asking a representative from each of those committees to work directly with Tiana and her team to kind of broaden the scope of how we reach a broader subset of our community and not just, I, I know part of the problem with community organizing is you can put all these things out there and do all this effort and five people show up and it's the same yeah. five people that show up to all the things and then you're not really getting that broader set of input. But if we can kind of help pull the resources that we have in existence and then those resources can kind of help the outreach go that much further, just sort of a thought. Yeah, I love that. One thing we found really helpful in Grafton with the resiliency zone down there was that once we really started to engage with the town leadership, all of a sudden, um, it's just, it's like leveraging that credibility, right? It's that, it's that third party <laughs> verification that, um, this is, this is a good thing. And, um, and it would, yeah, it really, it really just lent a lot of credibility to the project down there. Because initially people were like, why are you giving us these batteries? Like, why are you, why are you giving this away? <laughs> what's, what's the catch? Um, and it's like, well, the catch is we want to stop have, you know, we want, it takes a crazy amount of time to restore these lines over and over and over again. And we, in a tremendous amount of money, and we don't want people to be out of power. That's the catch. Um, so any help we can get from you all to to both identify who's important to engage with um and then help help just in that um outreach is is would be tremendous so if you if you guys want to do that then my request would be of tiana's that she sent us a 
you know, a draft letter of support that they'd be looking for yeah. to go with their application. I, I'm in. You're in? Yeah. When, when does she need the letter of support by? I think we need it by, if today is the 27th, I think we need it like April. We have it drafted, just so you know. Um, yeah, and then I think we need it by next, like when, Tuesday or Wednesday. So we would have to make the motion tonight? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> that can be signed, signed by the chair of the select board. Or town manager, or do we have to sign it? No, this? you guys don't have to sign it. Yeah. She could do a lab or support. I can just type your names on it, um, which is fine. Okay. No. One more, one more question that you. Yeah. Uh, I was reading here that there, there might be a fee at the end of the ten years. Uh, I'm sure that's a placeholder, but you have any any idea what that fee would be for? Be if you decided, or if a customer decided they just didn't want anything to do with the batteries anymore and completely wanted them uninstalled, like removed. So, okay. okay, so, so if, if, if they, they were stayed, stayed with the program, program there's, there's a good chance, chance there would be no fee for, for that. that yeah, and yeah, and it is, you're right, it's a placeholder, right? So for the program that we have now, the hope is at the end of 10 years, um, we, we turn it over to the customer and they can have the batteries, the batteries still will have life in them, or they sign back up for our next iteration of whatever that that battery storage looks like. What What's amazing, and when you think about it with our phones, right, is it's like batteries get better and better and better and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so that same footprint of a battery might actually have even more capacity for storage. And so, you know, it's hard to say right now what 10 years from now will, will happen with the technology, but it's just if, if somebody, you know, if we went to the expense of installing and giving the batteries and all of that, and they're like, never mind, we don't want anything to do with this, um, to pay for that uninstall cost, which at this point, um, it varies by installer, but we, we also haven't had that happen, I should say. And we have 4,000 devices out there. Thank you. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so do we have a, a motion to include a letter of support for the Green Mountain Power project? I would move that. Okay. Second. Hey, all in favor? Aye. All right. Good to go. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Tiana. Thank, thank you all so much. It's a, it is a very, very exciting thing to be happening in Bethel. Um, we're really excited to work with you all. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much for the time. Any questions at all, I'm gonna forward that the slide deck to you. Maddie's um, email is on it, but you'll have my email as well. And yeah, just look forward to, to working with you all. And it, I do have a question. Yeah. How did you pick Bethel? How did Why, you pick Bethel? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> so it's a combination of, um, we do something where we look at um, the CDC social vulnerability index, um, and we use that in addition to the number of outages that customers experience. We overlay those two things that helped us identify communities that are most in need. Additionally, when you look at all of these strategies we were planning on implementing as part of our climate plan, Bethel really was an ideal community because it had all of the aspects that we wanted to include. So you have the ability to do a microgrid. We have the ability to underground. We have homes that would be in need of the home batteries. And so it was just this nice little sort of microcosm of um, of needs that that kind of like fit all in together. Um, and that's that's how we chose Bethel. So Tiana, if you send me the letter of support, I can get that on letterhead and deal with that um, tomorrow or the next day. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you well, have a good night. Thank you. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so we had the state revolving loan fund application for the phase two water project. Yep. So that's a. Uh, <laughs>
<clears throat> there are one or two. Okay, there's one. All right. Good night. Thank you. So you can see the application in here. It's all pretty standard. Um, the the, the um, engineers put it together, and I fill in some information for them, and then they put it all together. It's the same application we filled in for the 2.8 million and you know, any other loans that we've done before that. So we just need to get it, uh, as you can see, we'll just need a motion for the approval, and then there's a place on it for, let me get to the last page, I think it's here, for all of you to sign. Let's see, yep, the last page. So if you have any questions on the content of the application, I'm happy to answer those. Any any questions? It's good to me. Is that uh, is that signed by yeah, all of us? Yep. Okay. So just need a motion to authorize a two point five million dollar loan application submission. So second. Okay. All in favor? So you'll see on this one, you need to sign your names and then print your name beside it. So, and Lindley, we'll have enough signatures. You'll be alright. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's they've got. Um, we will have four signatures on it, so you are safe. <laughs> as are you now. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> True. My phone's going off. I'm like, what is happening? My mother's next to me. My son's next to me. I'm like, I'm in a meeting. I'm in a meeting. I'm like, you guys have to wait. <laughs> no one wants you all day. And then I could hear it vibrating. I'm like, and it kept vibrating. I'm like, what the hell is this? It's like a dramatic pause, isn't it? <laughs> well, we can move forward to the... There you go, that's right. Not every day we do that. That's right. All right. We got the amendment to owner and engineer agreement on phase two water project. Uh, yep. So that would just require a motion for me to sign in two places. Okay, so we just need a motion to authorize the town manager to sign on behalf of the select board. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Then we have uh, the Bethel Energy Committee's request for a select board, to the select board to appoint a board member to be a liaison. Uh, so I talked to um, Nicole about this, and I think she was hoping to join, to come to the meeting tonight. And, um, but as I had stated a little bit of information here, she, they're working with Vermont Council on Rural Development in hopes to form a group to start a regional discussion about meeting the state's comprehensive energy plan. And what she had been saying all along was, while we had talked about these positions of energy coordinator, Nicole has stated 
numerous times that she wanted to, she wasn't put forward at the number of hours because she wasn't sure what exactly, you know, the towns needed. And so she was hoping to get together a group of people um, and talk about each town's needs so that they could then say, okay, yeah, we do need an energy coordinator if Two Rivers doesn't have the capacity and how many hours would that be and how much dollar amount would that be? And I saw your name was on there. Have you been a part of that discussion or with Nicole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do you have anything to add other than what I wrote in there? No. Okay. So they're looking to have a, a select board member to be on the energy committee? To be a lead, no, they're looking for a board member uh, possibly to be a liaison to this potential group. Um, so if that's something that you want more information about, I could ask Nicole to come to the next meeting. Um, she Obviously the letter is in here of um, that you know they were talking about and how the goals they want to meet and things like that. So she just wants to know if, if the select board would like to formally appoint a member to be the liaison to this potential group. Does, it doesn't need to be anything you need to do tonight, but this was her request. Do they have a, uh, an idea when this meeting might, these meetings might start? Oh, I think, yes. I emailed you that answer back. So Is she... Quarterly or something like that? Uh, does that mean, does um, that mean this quarter, which is like over oh yeah i kind of doubt it no she was saying yeah that's right i sent you back the information i forgot so she was saying that she was just thought maybe they would meet um what was it three or four times um kind of spread out do you know more about what they're possibly no yeah. i don't i it, don't even have a projection yeah it wasn't a huge meeting it wasn't a huge commitment of time it was um i honestly can't remember what the email said i read it and then forwarded it to you and yeah that was it. I'm sorry, I didn't retain. The interesting thing to me is if this GMP thing flows, mm -hmm. um, that makes a big difference on the town of Bethel's needs. That's true. It really does. It's a good point. You know, maybe what we need to do is just invite Nicole to come to a future select board meeting and talk about this a little bit more before you make any formal um, appointment or anybody's formally interested and, and also too I can forward Nicole well she's saying actually she just said they're gonna meet with the Energy Committee tomorrow so maybe once and you're right her, that's her committee uh-huh that's Nicole so we could always wait on this for another two weeks and see you know once Nicole has all the information that we'll have and she'll get that tomorrow yeah. happy to do that there, there I think been informal conversations among various individuals in the towns for quite a while now. Yeah. So this is kind of building on that. Yeah, so I can ask, move it to the next meeting and ask Nicole to come um, and just, uh, cause she, you know, then it'll be after the GMP presentation. Then you can ask her those questions, Dave, that what you guys would like to do. And I will say that this, this lady is, uh, what sort of are you? So, um, impressively knowledgeable. Articulate. Yeah. yeah. And articulate. I, mean, I will like, say during, crap. we had, a, <laughs> a, when we had one of the bigger outages that was out for a while, actually had someone that was a critical need person. And I called an event, and you know, obviously we know a couple people, and we got a hold of some people, and then I got a then she reached out to me and she was like, we're on it. I will have somebody there. We did not realize they weren't on, on the list that we had. And she, bing, bang, boom, mister. And it happened. Mm -hmm. And it ended up getting um, the person actually who, who was the critical care was like, I can hear trucks, trees, they're dealing with it. And uh, so they, she was very impressive and certainly, um, you know, let you know when there's updates, and I felt like she really kept us uh, in the loop. You're saying she's not, she's not even the head cheese. Yeah. I spoke to her and Maddie the other day that Maddie's on vacation. So, um, so do you, would you like to do that? Hold? Yeah, I would just table it until we have a little okay. more information on yep. the Makes sense. And then committee, well, when it's going to meet and what it's it, going to look like. And, and the, other, the fairness um, to Nicole is she'll have more information tomorrow that you had tonight. She'll get it at her meeting. So, um, okay. Not Is everybody problem. on the board fine with that? Mm -hmm. I'm good. Uh, okay. All right. So we'll just table that one. We, um, I see Ellie is in. So a couple minutes, Ellie will be right with you. Okay. Oh, okay. Because I'm waiting for my committee. 
Okay, yep, you just let me know when you're ready. Okay. Um, then we get some uh, liquor licenses, so we get a class one and class three for Tozier's. Um, class two liquor license for the Creek House. The store, yeah. The store. It's kind of funny, I gave you the list. That's now what, instead of those applications mm -hmm. that you signed, now what all Pam gets is that, you know, she highlighted them for you, the ones that we needed. So that you needed approval. Yeah, it was, it's kind of funny. It's all gone online now, so. Yeah, take the fun out of everything. It does. Just need a motion to approve those liquor licenses. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And we had the uh, VOREC um, project that's going to be going on that um, that will need a project manager that we've talked about in the past. So yep. there was um, an RFP had went out in regards to um, um, supervision for that project, and we had gotten two 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 in, uh, two, two firms companies, yep. that have put a number in. So Therese will talk about that further. One was um, Collier's. And they're out of Connecticut, I think, and. They had no, if they have any experience in Vermont, they did not list that on mm -hmm. their, app, their Boston Mass, out of, and on their application. So with that, they also didn't have any, they didn't also list any experience dealing with landowner outreach and trail building. Obviously, they're a massive firm because they're out of Boston. So they, you know, have experience with financial management, preparing RFQs, um, and managing, well, obviously, large projects. But they're really, their proposals were, construction based you know pretty much they were the ones who are building like big service areas and things like that so the other one was actually a local um it was local uh, the land artist llc uh was owned by chris fours who had a nice proposal and the big difference obviously we know exactly how much money it is it's thirty thousand one hundred and sixty four dollars well the clincher was Chris, who is very familiar with the project because he's got the school through theirs, he's done their Act 250 permit, he's done some trail building, he's also uh, working with Farron Griffin and Kyle Cartwright to do the stair project from behind the school. So his price was going to get us 603 hours, which is <clears throat> probably what it's going to take, please, to get the project done. Colliers, with their rate, was only we were only going to get 172 hours. It's, so you're just gonna get not yeah, gonna cut it. So three times the hours. Yeah, exactly. And he's local, and so we can work with him. So um, I would. So I think that you need to make a motion to award the contract to the Land Artist LLC um, for the grant amount, which is thirty thousand one hundred and sixty-four dollars. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. For any any questions on that before we vote. Okay, so you're none. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So Chris and I will meet on a you know weekly basis at first. I told him I'd give him information on you know draft RFPs, things like that, because we're this is obviously going to be a two-year project. We just barely got the VORAC grant agreement. Now we finally have a project manager, so Chris will take over. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of facets to this. You're doing not just building trails, but you're doing signage. You're doing you know a lot of planning. So. Um, Chris and I will meet and we'll get started and he can, we'll work together to, he'll do the major overseeing, but we certainly won't be constructing trails um, until next year. Kind of gives mm -hmm. us a chance to get out with the bid cycle, so okay. that should be good. All right. So we're looking forward to working with Chris. I think he'll be great. And I say we just bite off the last one here quickly, because I don't think mm -hmm. this the cannabis board information is going to take too long to discuss. But. I don't think so. Lindley, did you get the email I sent you with the link to the, okay, that you wanted? Lindley had um, asked about, uh, you are welcome. So from what I get, <clears throat> gather out of it, we kind of have two options. One, the town could decide to do nothing with it. Yep. And then everything gets deferred to the state. Yep. Or the town can establish its own cannabis board. Yep. Of which then... The applications go to us and then we send to the state. <laughs> exactly. So I guess it just depends on do we want to have a board that at least gets to look at it before it goes to the state? Because at the end of the day, we don't get to like deny it or prove it. Or, I mean, Not it's really. kind of a rubber stamp deal, but like, like liquor sort. license, right? Yeah, kind of sort of. Yeah, you'll have the, um, you'll be able to look at their proposal. Pretty much at this point, the only thing that 
in my opinion, that you'll be doing or that we'll be doing. You'll be looking at their zoning to make sure that they and adhere to the zoning regulation. We be, could we be assured that it's within zoning? Right, and that's really all you'd be doing. Um, so, so at this point, do we have to, so could we wait until there's a first applicant for something and then establish a board if we wanted to do that? Or is that something that we have to do now that we voted? No, you, uh, they just want to know what we're going to do. And um, I think I, yes, I have it. I do have a draft resolution, because you'll have to sign a resolution. And I said, if you choose to form a local cannabis control board, then you should sign the resolution at your April 10th meeting, because you want to wait for the 30-day vote to rescind after town mm -hmm. meeting. So, um, you know, it's, <clears throat> I guess, in my opinion, do we really, truly want to give the state any more control over anything? No. So I think that's my personal opinion. I think that you should do the CCB. You're not going to have a ton of applicants. Obviously, if there's someone growing that doesn't even affect you, doesn't even come to you, it's only retail operations. And then basically, you're just going to be making sure that they adhere to local zoning. Um, I just I think that it could be a mistake for us to allow the state to look. They're not going to know our zoning bylaws as well as we do if they even look at that i'm, I'm not really sure so because right. um, it looks like the application would come to the board if, if it was us mm -hmm. and then we would write a letter of approval or contingent upon something right mm -hmm. I mean, from what i understand yeah here. and the the laws are very strict about what you cannot do you cannot zone it out you mm -hmm. cannot um uh, you know, if you had a nuisance ordinance, and Lindley maybe read the links really, they're more about, I think one of them, uh, the 2291 maybe was about nuisance ordinances and the 44 was about um, zoning. So we know we can't zone it out. Mm -hmm. And um, nuisance ordinances, I think, are more for, you know, signages. I mean, there's obviously very strict state laws about where you can and cannot use cannabis. But did you gain anything from reading that statute, Lindley? I mean, nothing, nothing major, but I think I still would sort of, I, I would say what you were just saying, which was, this is one, it's, it's small. And as Chris indicated, it's kind of a, more of a formality, but it is a way to kind of keep tabs and have a little bit of say when needed. And so, you know, I, I sort of see it similar to liquor licenses as like, we mostly just know the list of people and, and, you know, retail spaces that have them. And so then when something goes wrong, we have a little bit of a leg to stand on to say, okay, we know who you are, we've signed this, but you're not meeting your your side of this agreement. And I think it would be the same to me with a cannabis board would be just a little bit of closer to home oversight that knows the situation here, as opposed to somebody from the state coming in and saying, well, I don't know, you know, so I would agree with your, your statement of it, it only benefits us to have whatever little amount of control we're being gifted. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, thought I thought it was interesting because Owen, Owen had asked a question last time, last time um, or, or at, at one point when we discussed cannabis, cannabis about um, what the sort, sort of away, away from school areas, areas would be if there's a buffer zone requirement. And I thought, I thought it was very interesting that there is a buffer zone for retail, for retail but not growing. growing. So, so you could not have a retail establishment within X amount of feet of the school, school but you could grow, grow it within X amount of feet from the school. So, so I, I thought that was a little bit interesting. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, I just think that, that as a select board, board you should know what's going on in your town. So I think eyeballing an application is makes sense. For a, For a whopping, whopping, I think you get a hundred bucks, or maybe it's two hundred. But each person? <laughs> no, no, just oh. one time. He's getting all excited. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, oh, no quid pro quo. So, so Paul gets off, and now we're starting to get paid for our company. That's right. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, I think I think I think it's a really good idea to do the local cannabis board for for all the reasons that were mentioned um, to still be able to deal with if there's some. Uh, business practices that get out of line or or local issues that come up, uh, it gives the board, you know, some leverage to be able to deal with some of those things. Yeah, there's not much we can do, honestly. It's uh, once the permit is gone, they are going to have very specific rules, just like people who sell yeah. alcohol. There's going to be a liquor, you know, just like there's a liquor inspector. Yeah. So I think really it's it's zoning, but it allows you to know what's going on and and um, so what I'll do is I will put the resolution on the agenda for April 10th. That way you've done your 30-day vote, vote to rescind is passed and um, you can sign the resolution and then wait 
confirm applicant. I have notified the Cannabis Control Board that uh, Bethel voters did pass cannabis. So um, I told the lady we'd let her know if you decide to form a board. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Anything more on that? Everybody nope. good? All right. Let's Ellie's see, got we everybody. already donated the eighty-five thousand dollars to something else. So. <laughs> well, Ellie, you were late, Ellie. We <laughs> yeah, didn't hear what we're building now. <laughs> what? No, she's just he's teasing. Uh, all right, you're on, Ellie. All right. The committee thanks the voters for their support of the skate park project. We are so so grateful. Following their approval, we have a construction proposal to work out with you, the select board, and the administration. We want to get on Michael Parker's schedule for this summer. We, uh, we feel that he has given us a good proposal. Um, Kyle Cartwright, as a construction business pri proprietor, is willing to take on the responsibility of overseeing the project. And we, uh, we, um, we uh, have submitted it um, to you. Um, and we're here to uh, um, get your feedback and get, get um, um, because Michael Parker has been so wonderful over the years. He, he works with us, he bends, he, 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 um, he says his schedule is getting very busy for the summer, but he's raring to go for it. So um, if I pull out the stuff for you to, for your um, zoning permit, so obviously you have to go to the DRB first. Um, so I did give you a copy of uh, the map of where the underground power is as well as the easement. So I want to make sure that for sure that Shane saw that as well as Kyle, yeah, because you may need to do, and you're always good at that, Shane, making some adjustments. Also, yeah, since you did not get your Phil Levet grant, then you're like really tight, like 320 bucks. So I know that what Shane did last time was kind of paired a couple things back. Um, and I did, was all fused between the land water conservation and the VOREC, and, but I think I've got that figured out. I wrote to land water conservation because they had said you had to do a cement walkway, but VOREC said you could do a block. I'm like, oh Lord. So. The, so the town, or the Volrec will build the blacktop um, sidewalk, which, and land water conservation agreed that that was okay if it wasn't concrete, it was blacktop. And I did write to her after I got your email about the fence to clarify. Everything you guys wrote looked like construction fence, right. but yet she called out fence, and I'm like, mm. so I did write to her, and I have not heard back yet. But we'll know all that before you, you'll have to know all that before you go to the DRB. Yeah, and, and will we have a cost of what the, the, the walkway is going to cost for the Vorek? Um, I don't know. It won't matter to you because it's not coming out of your pot of money. Okay. It's coming out of the 300000 okay. So the, you, you have to do, you guys have to do that handicap ramp. That's part of land water right. conservation. Right. So, but you you know that, and, yeah. and I'm sure you're aware of the dimensions since you guys wrote the grant. Right. And um, so, yeah, because there was definitely like, some confusion about, you know, I didn't want anyone to overlap. But um, so the DRB will be the ones to agree on your layout, um, okay. certainly to make sure you meet your setbacks, etc. Because it's a municipal project, it automatically has to go to the DRB. You know, we can't right. prove our own stuff. We've done before than before. Yeah, multiple times. And, and yeah, and we have yeah. a copy. I have the copy of the permit they gave us. Yeah. And, and uh, so here they. Yeah. The, the copy of the permit they gave us before and, and approved our thing in um, the fall of 2018. But yeah, just so, remember that all bets are off now because of well, that underground power. And right, I had talked but, to- but, but I know, because yeah. the permits are only for a certain time. Exactly. So I knew that we would have to do another permit. I know. So, and so, then, yeah, so then, basically I, I was foreseeing that we would do another permit. Yeah. 
and go before him again because I knew this one yeah. was good for only a limited number of right. time. And I which, think which, yeah, phase which, one. This one was in 2018, and uh. the the um, expiration date has passed. Exactly. For this one. Yeah. So I was anticipating that we would need to do another one. Right. That's why I'm on. I, I, as yes. soon as we got the proposal for Michael Parker, I said, let's get on the agenda for yeah. the select board. And so the select board, you know, obviously, so then you, you'll get, you go to the DRB, they'll give you the ultimate approval. But, um, so yeah, so you should be, the only question obviously was monetarily, but, and remember that was an estimate from Dylan a while ago, but you right. have a copy so you could always get an updated estimate from Dylan. And I did, I wasn't sure what you were gonna do, but I did, you could see in my math, I gave it to everybody that I took the 8,000 off thinking you were gonna have Dylan do it and then Michael would give you a credit. And so I wasn't sure, I was just trying to give you the numbers. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah, and we wanna work out and see if we can work out the evacuation stuff and the price for that. Yeah. I think we have time to do that. Um, and I appreciate that you sent the revenue um, <laughs> list yeah. and everything. But I do want to point out one thing. Yeah. On that list, you put the Markel Fund. Yeah, that was the amount that, you gave me, right? Yeah, but that, the Markel Fund was giving to us the committee in the spring of 2016. Right, I for think the, I just took the, yeah, that was the balance you said. So yeah, I, but I that, just, that's for the purpose of expanding the health and activities of families at the center. It's not for the skate park. Oh. Okay, it's not it's not in any revenue for the skate park. Okay, so so then you're gonna have to come up with more money. So yeah. then you're gonna have to cut yeah. more. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought okay. that it when so you said no, that that is that is not okay because when you but, said that I last time you said I hadn't included it. So that's yeah. fine. I'm happy to I'll take right. that. It's no big deal. Yeah. So you just, just so you know, you got to come up with more money. Right, and then and then in that figure that you gave me, we had a fundraiser. Um, and and one hundred and eighty nine dollars we just fundraised in February. Okay. So that we can add to it too. All right. I think. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I went back. I don't think I went back and picked. Yeah. That up. No, you didn't. You All right. Didn't well, close. Was... Anyways, you get what you're short a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. I assume yeah. that Shane yeah. will work his magic and will. Yeah. Scale back the skate right. park and. You'll have, you may have to anyways because of the DRB and you can't, right. because of the underground power situation. Right. I honestly don't know, Shane, if you're gonna have to add on both ends or what, because the width is a funky beast now. Well, right. with the, uh, we did follow the flags in the yard. Yeah, um, and I gave you a drawing with the measurements Richard took from the corner of the existing skate park, so I actually gave you some like solid numbers. Sure. So we, we have an idea about how close to the hole in the ice we can go, um, and we'll tune it as needed. Uh, but that was, that was the biggest reason we rounded the corner of, of the design, so that we had uh, clearance to do what we needed and yeah. still some decent continuity to the park. Yeah. So I, I think, I'm pretty sure we can make it work. Uh, but we'll we'll pay very careful attention yeah. to whatever people tell us for numbers and stuff. Well, and once we do, um, when you finally have an idea that Michael is coming, I'm happy to have, which I think might help, is to have Dig Safe come back before sure. you know before Dylan or or whoever you get to dig digs. Um, but certainly, just keep in mind that you know we need proof of insurance. You know, and I can talk to Kyle about all this, but. Proof of insurance, um, updated W-9 from him, and I can help Kyle with, if he wants to hire Dylan, I can put them in contact or whatever they wanna do. Um, but I really appreciate Kyle Aubrey. That's why I sent the email. I just, I'm gonna have possibly a $2.5 million water project. We got a big paving. I just have too many roads dug up to deal with a skate park. So I really appreciate um, you guys and Kyle yeah, dealing with that. I figured between Kyle and Shane. Yeah. That, that did not happen. Yeah, I just and, wanted to make sure because yeah. there are specific requirements to your grant yeah. and getting yeah. state, you know, the no, states involved. Very good, very I'm good. like, yeah, we're on. But Dietrich will help you with that. You could always get all, Shane, reach out to Dietrich when the pool opens about hoses and tell her about construction. Right, right. All good about that. So, yeah. I, I have a quick question, hopefully, a quick question about the sidewalk. Um, is that considered like a superficial thing? that can get closer to the underground power without counting against our square footage. Well, you wouldn't be building the sidewalk, Vorek will. Well, no, my, my point was like, does that three or four foot wide sidewalk 
cut into the available footprint that we would be able to use to get closer to the underground? Is it considered a topical treatment to the space? I don't know. That's a good question. I actually will. I'll, I don't. Uh, well, I don't have the easement in front of me. I'll have to double check because there's, there's plenty of time that people have sidewalk over underground runs. Right. So that, of course. That's, that's pretty normal. But I want to make sure that that's also normal for what we're trying to do here. Sure. Let me find out. I can talk to. Um, could, no, it's not. Because you do them. have a parking lot on top of it. Yeah. And you do have. We do have um, the gazebo and the ice rink on top of electrical lines too. Yeah, but they we had this is a new easement and they were oh. pretty specific in their language oh, if okay. you noted like yeah, more than wanna, GMP's ever been. Yeah, but let me wanna, find out and I'll yeah, email you guys. I just want to make sure with all the different. Well, also, things. a separate comment on the sidewalk. Yeah. If it's if we do have some decent funding for the skate park and sidewalk stuff. Um, the, if the sidewalk continued all the way to the other end of the of the skate park, it would give kids like an on and off ramp. Like if they miss miss the jump a little bit or something, mm -hmm. they would have a little more forgiveness. So if that was, it would give the, the park better continuity too. If the sidewalk went all the way to the end, all the way to the other end of the skate park. Yeah, I'm not sure we'll be able to adjust that because it's already was approved in the VORET grant, and it was. And I'm not sure how specific, but we just hired the you know, the project manager tonight. So I may have to dig into that a little bit with Chris okay. and just look through Did the plan. Did you say it was Chris Ford? Mm hmm Oh, good. Yeah. Good. So I will look and I'll reread the easement again and figure out the whole sidewalk thing. I can talk to our local GMP representative too. I know when I'd asked him about the skate park, I'm like, well, can we build the skate park over? He's like, no. And, uh, but whether we run the sidewalk, I don't think we, I, I would think that they would allow us, but you're still going to have to stay within 10 feet of their, on your side of their easement. So if he, even if he lets us run our sidewalk over, um, I don't think it's going to help you gain you any ground. Oh, sorry, Dave. Dave might know. I'll, when, you're talking about, when you talk about power under the parking lot and over the ice cream and all, that is secondary power. That well, only has to be buried. The parking eight, lot is the same power that's going in the field. That, that piece, but I... I I'm thinking that they're going to the power. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I know that power has to be 42 inches deep and accessible. The secondary is only 18 inches deep. It's too, even though it's electric, it's different. Yeah. So just be prepared for them to say no. Okay. I guess that's what I'm saying. Because when uh, was doing the lines to the reservoir, yeah, did it from the telephone pole straight up. Uh, under the parking lot, uh, up through the field. That's the same one. Yeah, so let me reread the easement, and I can also okay. oh, here we go. Okay. Make myself a note, and I'll also reach out to our local GMP person who okay. is not Kayla Polly. It's okay. the guy who I forget, but I'll reach out okay. to them, Great. and then also too, I'll just need a heads up before you start any excavation. Like, okay. give me a month or something, because dig safe can be sure. slow, and I can call dig safe and have them come back and remark for sure. Um, but let me look at that, Shane, and I'll email you guys because I know for a fact you can't come within 10 feet of you know, the ease on your side, but I can double check on the We're sidewalk. Only four feet, so that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty obvious. Yeah. But a sidewalk being a topical thing, I didn't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll reread it because I don't think they called out sidewalk specific, but let me just verify. So additionally, we can go the sidewalk to the other side. Yeah. It could be on the back edge of, of the skate park. That one. Yeah, unless, I know, but it, there's a setback thing. Uh, there might, I think there will be a setback on the back. Plus two, Vorek only has X amount of dollars to build it from the existing. So it's a whole bit of an intertwined okay. web. But I'll, um, I'll look at it, Shane. Um, also, so we're going to have to meet with DRB before the official sign on with Parker. Is that correct? Or, yes. Well, the DRB, yeah. the sl no. you've got the money because it was given yeah. to you at town. You yeah. know what your so budget we, is. Yeah. I don't know what the select board's going to do, but the DR, you can't do anything until right. you have your DRB so, approval and post so your you permit for 50 say, days. You could say, depending on what the DRB, yep. you can do the contract. Which is what I said to the select board in my notes, was that they could, they would be pending DRB approval. Yeah, okay, okay. so you can approve tonight. 
and we can get dates from Michael Parker, and then that could be depending on what the DRB. Yeah, because there's okay. a certain process. One, one thing that I did not see directly in Parker's um, uh, proposal was all of the dimensions of all of the features. Um, I don't want something getting missed. So if, I don't know what Kyle had sent him by way of dimensions for some of the, you know, we, we yeah. threw together a concept. It was drawn to scale and it has real dimensions in my CAD file, uh -huh. but I don't know if he transcribed 100% of that geometry into his, the, the images that he returned in his proposal. I don't know, I never saw, I didn't see what Kyle sent to him. And when you do your sit down to do your DRB application, it has to be very specific. Okay. You have to measure your setbacks, you have to tell them exactly the width and the dimension of exactly what you're building. Yep. So you'll have to have a meeting and sit down with Kyle and, and um, because when you see the second page of the zoning application, it has like little grids and you have to say how many what dimension each grid is, that sort of thing. And so they're gonna want all the details in relation to, you know, spatial relation to a couple things that are already there too. So, um, and you know, the DRB is good. You guys have been in front of them before. And yeah. worst case scenario, they need more information. They'll table you for a couple of yeah. weeks, so. Yes. I just wanna make sure we have time to make sure perfect before we agreed contractually. Yeah, I'm not sure that you have even you haven't even submitted your DRB application yet. So no. we don't have to, the select board, if they approve it, we'll just say, yeah, pending DRB approval. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so. can, can we, so I'm having a hard time oh, I can. through the revenue and cost piece of this, so yeah. the way it was set up. So could you let, could you tell us what the total revenue is and then what the total cost? And then I have a second question is, if I'm reading this right, why would we, Parker's quote includes all the excavation and materials for 77,000. Yep. So why would we deduct, why would we take the optional deduction of 8,000 and then hire somebody that's gonna cost more than $8,000 to do the because excavation no, work? Because no, it doesn't say that because Parker says right on his first page, it says the town of Bethel will be responsible for final grading, ditching and seating around the skate park. And um, so last time we did that, we had to pay, um, we paid Dylan separately to do that. And it also says right here on page two that the town of Bethel will provide the drainage, basic swale drainage, grading, reseeding, and obviously any of the signage. Um, well, that's just, that's just drainage and grading that would be sloping away from the park or whatever, but. Yeah, so here he's right. saying that, okay, so I get what you're saying. So he's saying so town subcontracts the removal the of thing. topsoil and sub with replacement. And I didn't bring Dylan's breakdown of his price, so which I can. I mean, I think you have to carry some cost yeah. to do some, some uh, drainage or grading away from the park so everything drains correctly. But yep. I, I think what you have here is not exactly, I think Park, I, I think what Parker's saying is he's going to do everything except for any type of drainage improvements. Right. And that would be on the town, which... Which is what he states, that we'll be responsible for the grading. I just think by taking the $8,000 deduction and then adding sixteen into it, you're going to be paying more money than you could have if you just hired... Yeah, well... Hired somebody to come in for a day or two and clean up around the park. It's not going to take a lot. Well, when we did last time, I think, Ellie, the cleanup that we did last time, we ended up having to pay Dylan. Yeah. And it was several thousand dollars. It was like yeah, at least nine, six grand. Nine. nine to come, yeah. That's right, nine grand but that, to come But he in did after. the excavation work, too. But he came in. He charged us nine to come in and do all the final. Topsoil, yeah, the whole yeah. finish product yeah. was nine. Um, and then um, we did pay him to do the original digging and excavation because I think it was going to be cheaper. But I certainly can go through and do a bit different or a better breakdown. I, I would just I, I would just take a good look at that and make sure okay. you have a good handle on it because I don't think that at the end of the day, you know, You're, it's going to take eight thousand dollars to do any ditching and final grade. Yeah, because that's what he charged last night. I don't, I can look at Dylan's bill, certainly, because he, and I can always get more information from Dylan if he only did a portion of it, so he could break it down, so we could see. Right. Um, and, and there are other people that we've talked to about doing an excavate, and we wanted, we've been trying to get comparisons 
mm -hmm. between Dylan's and other people here in town. Yep. To see if we can work out maybe a cheaper, yeah, cheaper one. So, um, so at the top of the sheet, the revenues I'd put in the packet, I took her land conservation grant. The yeah. C above was revenue she'd raised before, donation, coin drops, and then I had a, I had one expense in here because I had already included it in the revenue. I had to reimburse someone for the food cost. IOB was um, the work that um, Lindsay had done with the you know the online programming, and then here's some more donations. Oh, and I had put in the balance of the Markle Fund because I misunderstood. I thought Ellie wanted it applied to this project. So mm -hmm. that's how I came up with this $2,430.15. And you can see I applied it below. So, so I took Parker's 77000 minus the 8000 for optional deduction and then added back in Dylan because Dylan's quote was based on doing the excavation and the final grade work. The 52800 is... Um, the land water conservation match that they raised, they ended up getting, at first we thought it was going to be 25000 but they ended up giving a little bit more money. And um, you can see right here, the 2430 is basically fundraising that she, she came, that Ellie did, or in right. her group did, over the required match, because right. they had to match that 26400 right. And then their 30000 voted in at town meeting makes them short $329.85. But... Um, so, yeah. so, so roughly, uh, roughly it's eighty-five thousand dollars is the cost of the park. Cost and the revenue is yep. within three hundred dollars of that. Is that sound yep. right? Yes. Yep. So, yeah. So my because my total revenue is eighty-three thousand seven hundred ninety dollars and forty cents. Yeah. So we're within spitting distance, but okay. I can. Um, I had sent you uh, Dylan's proposal, but I certainly can look at that again because I don't have it in front of me. I can look and see for the 16,000 <clears> that Dylan, I can see if he broke it out as to what part would be final grading and what part would be the prior. So maybe we could try to compare because either way you're going to pay for the final grading and stuff. So I can look at Dylan's estimate again. Um, I know I sent it to you, but I can look at it again. Just I'll make it up. Look and closer and at and Dylan's yeah. number um, versus the eight thousand dollar deduction. Okay. And we have a couple more hundred waiting for us at Bob's end. Oh yep. Oh good. Yep. Yeah. Sure. I picked those checks up periodically. Bottles. Yeah. yeah so awesome. Yeah. We're still we're still um, you know adding to that. Yeah. Of course, you guys are always fundraising. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I think that in my advice would be your next plan would be to sit down with certainly your group and Shane and Kyle right. to do your map to just right. figure out because then you can kind of see exactly where your easement is, right. where you have, and, and I've sent you everything I have yeah. for that yeah. so that you can... Um, that way, when you go to the DRB, it's all you know straightforward right. for them. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Kyle's somewhere snowboarding, so he can't be here. I, th I think once the grass is showing and Dig Safe shows up again, that'll be all the documentation we would need. We can take pictures and put like little pins in where the per we intend the perimeter of our stuff to be. Yeah, and but that'll be too. DRB won't. You, DRB. If you're going to the DRB now, you have to have your map. You know, right. done now. Right. So, um, yeah, that's but May second. You get we di already did the measurements for you right off the corners yep. of yeah. the skate park, and then you can see where he triangulated it to a um, storm drain okay. cover or a sewer cover, so yeah. you could see you know all of his numbers. Because yep. I verified it the other day with Richard. Right. Yeah, I think I think our rounded corner more than compensated for the 10 feet. That's okay. Probably like 12, but right. that's off memory. So is that one square finished product or is that what's there now? That's what there is there now. <laughs> 22 feet by uh, three inches from the power line and they're going to put in 30 feet wide place? Well, I think so. not I'm right sorry. there, they're not. <laughs> they're going to have to go off one end. Wide, but yeah. like I said, we haven't seen the map to the DRB. Like so, and so Dave, it's like 20 feet wide, not 30. 20 existing now, and then it would be another 16 or whatever we can get away with. On that, on that front corner, you've only got 12 feet. 
Yeah, so they're not going to touch the front. So obviously, that's it. Okay, I'll have I'll have to see the stuff again. Yeah. So in the end, because it's a municipal project, it will go to the DRV. So, you know, as we they said, have all that information. huh? They have all that information. Yeah. Yes, they, yeah. they do. Yeah, I already made the DRV copies um, right. for it. So. Um, so what motion do you need tonight? Because it sounds like there's potentially some changes that will happen to Parker's quote, right? Because right, right. you were going to double check to make sure all the features and stuff were correct. Right. Um, so if any of that stuff changes, I'm just trying to figure out, like, yeah. what is the motion that we put forward so that if there are any changes that are within reason that they can be done and not have to be reapproved or right. so on and so forth. So. so you haven't put in your zoning application yet, so you're not no, even going No, because it's May 2nd that the that we have an appointment and with That's the what team. I was going to say, so you'll be going on the 2nd. Okay, yeah. I thought it was early May. Yeah, so, um, May 2nd is our appointment with the DRB. So your when will you have sat i guess here's the question that they're looking for is perhaps when will you stock to talk to michael parker we about want to talk to him this week or whatever we just want to get some if we're go gun uh whatever we want to make sure that he has a certain time frame <clears throat> that he it's available for him to to do the work so so I'm understanding you right, Elliot. So we're looking for your approval pending DRB approval to give Michael a commitment. Say we're we're go. We're go. What what when? Right. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Right. When when in August can are you open, My, Mr. Parker? When in August are is this so many weeks? How many weeks is in there? So um, the, yeah. The seventy-seven thousand. Yeah. Includes or does not include the eight thousand dollar option. It includes the eight thousand. Includes. Yeah. So, if we were to approve the seventy-seven, and we didn't need it, I'm not sure it's a monetary award. They know what their budget is. They know how yeah, much money yeah. they have. Yeah. yeah. They're basically just looking for but some I think sort of that's approval from you to book Chris Michael Parker. <clears throat> Correct. Pending DRB approval. Because if that doesn't get approved, we understand. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the cost of the park that I come up with is $85,560. That's, that's if you take it this way. $77,000, mm -hmm. but we take the $8,000 um, option out, and then we add in... Um, Dylan's price. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that's the most expensive price, right? Yeah. And that, um, so that's 77 minus the 8, add in 16,560. And I get 85,560. Does that sound right? Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to, because what happens is if we make an approval and then you change it, then you're going to need approval again. Unless we can approve it with something like a monetary value, right? So we could say, mm -hmm. You know, we're we're going to make an approval not for the park exceed. not to exceed eighty five five sixty. Yeah. As, yep. Assuming that you get your yeah. your approvals for right. um, the That's local DRB, et cetera, et cetera. Because yeah. I'm just trying to make it so that you guys have some leeway, so you don't have to come back to get approval right. if some changes. Yeah. 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 That's reasonable if you if you approve, uh, like you said, eighty five thousand. Then we know what to work for because we know we have eighty three thousand seven hundred ninety five thousand five sixty. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't know if anybody's else checked yeah. that. Yeah. If we were able to raise other funds, though, we'd we'd want a little bit of wiggle room on that. So have a disclaimer for. Uh, oh, I, I I actually disagree. I mean, at some point you got to call it. And the fact right. is, you don't know what you're going to run into in the ground. If it's right. really muddy, you need you have basically there's like no contingency in here. So I think mm -hmm. if you called it at eighty five thousand mm -hmm. and you're still three hundred twenty nine bucks short, if the whole total is eighty five thousand five sixty, I think anything you fundraise over this, right. you need some sort of cushion because right. if you start excavating and you find you know Hoffa. Uh, you're, you're all of a sudden, oh, all of a gosh. sudden, this skate park just got really small yeah. because of all the costs that you're going to have tied up in excavation. So, yeah. 
you know, so I think that we're, you know what I mean? There's just like, there's no wiggle well, room. I mean, or you can. So that's my concern you know, we, is you're just yeah. super tight and God forbid there's something under there we don't know about. Or we could put in the motion that, you know, that it's not to exceed 85, 560. That includes, well, that is it. That is in reference to a 1,400 square foot addition to the park. Mm -hmm. So we're not expanding out. So even if Tony Hawk himself showed up today <laughs> with a million dollars, that we're staying at right. 1,400 square feet. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you want to add accessories to, to the back. park, then that would give them the leeway yeah. Yeah. to fundraise and put accessories on the park, right? Right. right. Is everybody kind of following that? Now, now, does the sidewalk count against the 1,400 or whatever number we are agreeing? No. About? The sidewalk is Vorek. No, that's totally, that's like, yeah. we're just gonna call that's my project. So no, the only thing that counts against you is your ADA accessible, and I can't remember the dimensions on that thing, but that, that counts on your square yes. footage. But no, the other one is my problem. Yeah, the- um, <laughs> My square footage. Yeah, 50 by four. The sidewalk is 50 by four. Yeah, but I don't know what your ADA ramp is. I don't know what that is specifically. Oh. But no, your side, the sidewalk does not count against you, Shane. Just the handicap part. So who's going to make sure that the sidewalk does not uh, interfere with the easement? Me. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it'll yeah. be me. And I'm sure, I'm out. sure Kyle will too. Yeah, and I'll, I'll deal with that because that's. Yeah. I'm going right. to have to deal with the sidewalk issue right. along with some other boat wreck stuff. So right. that's not your right. problem. So That'll if the sidewalk's fine. different than the actual addition to the skate parks, 1,152 square feet. Does that sound right? Yeah. Uh, probably. Yeah, because the, the this sidewalk is, doesn't count. This is, a, them. this is a preliminary, this is as close a concept <laughs> as we could whip up in a weekend. Yeah. So this is, I would say it's, it could use some refinement. Mm -hmm. And if, if the footprint, um, could grow or shrink a little bit. I didn't want that like, you know, 10% or something. I didn't want that like being a deal breaker for, for finishing the park. Yeah. Well, we can just, if it's 1150, 11,100, sorry, 1,152 square feet, we could just say 1,400 rounded up. Not to exceed, right? Again, yeah. So not to Because again, like the, the formal way of doing this would be here is the exact yeah. contract that <laughs> Michael Parker wants us to sign with all the items on it, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that we know 100% that that is exactly yeah. what he's going to build. I, I Where right now we don't have that, so I'm trying to give you the leeway so you don't have to come back again and do it again. Right. Yeah, know? agreed. So. That makes sense if you want to. So I guess the motion, if. So you said it's working. Yeah. yeah, so I guess the two things I want to put in the motion is, so the motion would be to approve phase two of the skate park and the contingencies would be that it wouldn't exceed $85,560. Mm -hmm. um, or unless fundraised further. Mm -hmm. um, and then that the, the footprint would not exceed 1,400 square feet. And, and they uh, have to have DRB, and, and DRB, DRB approval. approval. Right. But, <clears throat> any, any further questions or anything added to the motion? <laughs> I know. It's, it's, I know. I'm just trying. To well, no, it so makes sense. You're trying to cover all your bases, and you're trying to give them flexibility, right. and you want them to build what they'd like to build. It all works together. You have anything to add to that, Lindley? <laughs> that <was good. laughs> She's like, no. I'm <laughs> okay. So that's the motion on the table. So we just need a second. Okay. I made the motion. So second by Jean. All in favor? All right. All right. So we are good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that might be what Thank you. Jones. Thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate. Yeah. Appreciate all you do. Yeah. So I'll look into the easement yeah. and the sidewalk, and we'll just. I'm sure once Kyle's back, we'll be in touch, and then once I know right. what's going on, I'll get dig safe back. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Evening. Have a good Thanks, night. Guys. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Did we have anything public comment wise, uh, other than Owen online and? Joanne? Doug or Joanne? You look like you have a list. <laughs> oh, look at your list. <laughs> I'm like, oh. The list is growing as long as she's staying. Oh, oh, boy. No, I just have one thing I saw tonight coming into town from South Main Street. One of those round manhole covers is off of the, the hole. Where? Come in into town before you get to the town office. Uh -huh. It's on the right-hand side, uh, right on that last little curb. Oh, dang. Yep, right, it's completely dang. off of it. 
Oh, thank you for so much. All right. You need to raise it now. They are. He set up a YouTube camera just to <laughs> capture whoever hits that. Yeah. 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 Make some money on that one. <laughs> That's right. Um, it could have been like a big truck or something rolled thank over. Thank you, it, just Joanne. Just just oddly and pop, just cover off. Well, thank you. And yeah, Owen does have his hand up. When I leave here, I'll buzz down that way and see if it's still like that. Yeah, thanks. Let me know. Text me. Or I got to go that way anyways. I got to go. Up. Yeah, Owen has his hand yep. up. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Owen. Hi, y'all. Um, Owen here. I just uh, wanted to say, let us know how we can help with the Green Mountain Power project and grant. I heard some discussion about equity and inclusion and you know, our, our group is small but mighty, but I can already think of at least two people that I think would be really interested in being a part of that. So just let us know. All right. Ready? Pam's going to send you an email, Joanne, if she hasn't already. Just she was in here cleaning the other day and there was something she had a hard time, like some a lot of paper that had been discarded. And she said she had to flip the can over to drag it out. And I thought that was going to take care of Oh, so she got it. I will make sure that that is not out of the again and that we take care of our food. Oh, that was nice. Yeah, she said she said she couldn't figure out what was in there. And she I got laughing because, you know, Pam, she, of course, she won't leave it. So she said, I knocked the can over. I'm dragging it out. And I was like, oh, Lord. I will make sure that we take care of our food. Thank you. That was very nice. Yeah, thank you. It was just she was she's like I said send Joanne an email. She'll take she'll take care of it. Okay. Anything else public comment wise? Okay, hearing none. We'll finish up uh, town manager's report, whatever you had left there. And we did a, a fair um, amount of it. So um, with help from Chris Jarvis, I submitted a congressional earmark for to Welch's office for four for one point four million. That'd be for the first one and a half miles of Camp Brook Road, and it includes lining the large culvert near Charlene Shepherd's house. So we're gonna know by the end of April if Senator Welch is going to support our request or not. So if he's not, there may be opportunities for us to try with somebody else, maybe Bernie Sanders again, or um oh, I'm trying to okay. Thank Ballant. Ballant. Ballant, maybe. I'm not sure. So um, so we did get that in. There's also some information in here about our agreements with the bank, since obviously there's nationally been some bank uh, destabilization. Um, also let you know that um, the Pub Planning Commission is going to be holding their public hearing on the zoning bylaws on April 20th. So it behooves you to attend or to have looked through the zoning in advance because if you have a concern or question let me know or come and we'll deal with it the planning commission can deal with it then if they they make any changes they need to do and then it comes to you mm -hmm. so yes you have to have a public hearing but if you make any substantive changes it Goes kicks back. it back to the pc so it behooves you to get let the pc deal mm -hmm. with it before it gets to you um so but no one's ever been able to tell us what the definition of substantial change is right right it's <laughs> exactly you know it's how much true. is substantial versus we not actually substantial. talked about this a little yeah. bit yeah. at the pc it's always kind of funny you know? it is kind of funny minor stuff i i guess if you all of a sudden want to change a cutting a zoning yeah. district yeah. acreage he'd probably say that's yeah. it but it's also just nice. And that'll think, be set up just like normal where the changes will be highlighted or Yeah, and or, I think I sent you guys a link to that already. Not Denise, because she already had it. It's, it's online. Yeah, and I... I say, someone sent it to me. I sent it to you guys, um, all of you but Denise, because Denise, as I said in the email, was well-versed in it. So um, the other thing that I had told you about a while ago was that in 2010, the select board had added 5.81 miles of class four town highway. Um, a piece of that was Pond Road. And so I talked to Joanne, thank you very much. I talked to Joanne's brother, I talked to people. And then I have brought Jean Burnham came in, God bless her soul, and she researched these miles. And we, you, the gentleman, Jonathan Croft at the state gave us some information and it, we're not gonna add any of that. They're not class four roads because what, I don't understand the process. And of course, unfortunately for us, all of the ancient road committee members have 
deceased, are deceased now. It appears for any of the notes that I found that when they were added, the select board approved them, but they still needed research to be done. And they should never have been submitted to the state without the mapping and all of this research. And Gene went through deed after deed after deed, and we can't find where people, you know, referred to them as town roads. We don't have them as laid out as town roads. So. Did, did we get <clears throat> all of uh, John Dutton's paperwork? Yes. And in John Dutton's notes, it, a lot of them in pencil said, you know, needs mapping or needs research. So I'm not sure how it all happened and there's no one to ask. I've been yeah. through their notes and Gene's been through deeds. So I reached out to the state and told Jonathan that it would be my recommendation to the select board that you do nothing. They're, they're not town roads. We have no proof that they're town roads. And um, he said that was fine. You don't have to take any action. They did not add them in 2010. This town of Bethel was notified multiple times that they needed information, yeah. and they never did it until something, um, actually some question on Pond Road came up, and um, I was like, yeah. it's not a road, it's not on the map, and then we went in and did the research. It must have so. been somehow part of the ancient roads, but the ancient roads, I think, <clears throat> deadline was like 2014 or 15. It, that road went all the way through. It, That's when you had to. It used to be a stage, stage, stage yeah, it yeah. did deadline, but then the state the legislature passed another extension to it not an extension oh. they just originally it was supposed to everything that wasn't saved as ancient road was supposed to go bye bye right. and they changed yeah. but they changed it of course there was oh. another they another that was like 14 or 15 when yeah. it was supposed to exactly if you didn't move them to a class fourth road then they were yep. really gone right does that affect property lines? it doesn't affect anybody's property no. lines no so people still have you know access or easement to their you know property but we have no proof and we've looked at everything i con this one one woman was wonderful at the state she went down in their paper files and went sent me stuff and jean finally said that's it trice my head's gonna explode i can't find any of this and then i actually had a very good conversation with um, mr lana lana the surveyor excuse me mr lana and we were had a good conversation about it last week so so anyways, just wanted to let you know, we finally, or I say we, Gene, you know, reserve, but we're just not going to act on it. Um, Are you saying that it's a private Yep. So can you have that sign at my entrance we change to say private on that? Sure. You and, bet. And I can plus? You bet. And then I can also um, put a fence across there if I want to at the corner of the brook. I don't see why not. I mean, it's still, it's not, it's not a town road, so I don't know why you can't. Yeah, and I'm not sure, isn't, I have to look at the map. I think the only map. thing you just have to isn't be careful the tip, of is. Isn't the first beginning a pond is town? It's after, right? I'd have to look at a state highway map. I'll have to look. Because that first part of pond may be a town road. It may be what goes beyond that was... I don't have a state highway map in front of me, so yeah. I'll look. If if it's all private from the get go, then I'll we'll that's get you your, something. That's your driveway, right? Well, that's your driveway. So I will look. I do know on an old town map it said the, I'm not, don't quote me on this number, but it looks like it said Highway 78 or something like yeah. that. I'll let me look, Joanne, because I don't know. I'm going to put Pond Road private question mark. And, um, but yeah, after whatever you do on your property behind you is your business. And the gentleman who bought the property that does abut you was in the same mind as you. He didn't want going, you know, he was all good. You guys were on the same page. I'm just more worried about people driving. You know, sometimes uh, we've seen the UPS driver go down that road to oh, turn around. Yeah. And the flooding on that brook has or up down by that culvert. And well, we have had some crazy stories of some, like. Wait until the 18 wheelers try to take exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Because going... Garmin says that's the shortest. Well, route. they tried to go past <laughs> Hooper Hollow. I know. It's past crazy. what's the gen Robert Franks. Yeah. They, because they so they left a perfectly good paved road to go out Hooper Hollow and got stuck out in the pucker brush because they thought it was a quick ride. <laughs> Chester. Oh, then, it is. It's a quick ride. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, let me look at that, Joanne. I'll send you an email this yeah. week and let you know. So if it is all you, then we could certainly change it to private. All right. No. <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah, good, yeah, hey, good on you. Um, but, so that, finally we put that to bed, so thank God. And um, I'm still working on Sugar Hill to find the history of that. Um, updated okay. your rules of procedure to have the edits in it that you wanted, and... Um, the only thing with the Sugar Hill one, it might be, might be good here in the next, before, any, you know, go and whack all that stuff down while it's... I know, I talked to Morgan about it, yeah. Before anything buds there. Well, what's... I think most of his gripe was just knocking that stuff down. It, and then you could, was. you know, look at... Yeah, I, I got some more. I talked to Bev Washburn. I actually talked to Joanne because Joanne's the road layout lived there. But time, but. The road layout is actually not as Sugar Hill. And so I talked to, I have pulled everything I can find, talked to Joanne, talked to um, Mr. Lana. And I have a feeling that how it's laid out is that since we, I can't find the original road survey, it looks like it may have been laid out originally as part of Camp Brook Road. So the state of Vermont sent me this really handy dandy like eight page uh, thing that lists roads and what book and page they're recorded in the layouts. And I have a feeling because most people that lived on there originally had an address that was either rural route or a certain number Camp Brook because I can't find it as Davis, Freeland, you know, it became Sugar Hill around 911, which is exactly when they would have been saying if there's more than two houses or three houses, you're going to get a 911 address. Yeah. So I swear everything is a research project lately. So, um, but I did call Joanne to pick her brain and I did hear from Bev Washburn. So okay. um, we're still working on the original survey of that road. All right. Anything else on yours? No, I, that's good. We have the uh, select board meeting minutes from the 13th of March. So Paul sent me an email today and noted that at the beginning, the title should say minutes and not agenda. So, yeah. <laughs> so there is a correction there. One correction at the end. It says the next meeting of the select board will be April 27th. Oh. 2023. <laughs> it was wishful thinking, Denise. I know. She tried to slip one by us. <laughs> To watch her. She it does was that just once a while. Yeah, so, all right, April. I didn't even. I just read it and thought Julie here, was. Here I was like, Julie. Julie's right. I was. So that's funny. Okay. So any other amendments? I will fix that. So that's March. That's funny. Uh, yeah, you were right. I was like, it looked good to me. I read it and proofread it and made adjustments and still didn't catch it. So change the title and next meeting date. That's funny. <laughs> so just uh, any other further amendments to the meeting minutes? If not, just need a motion to approve the minutes as amended. So okay, move. It sounds like Dave and Denise got it covered. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And well, there was a couple other um, communications in the back. There was, uh, any oh, other no. business there you want to talk about, Yvonne Drive? Yeah, so um, I put on the table a letters from, so we had had an issue with Avon Drive um, and you had dealt with it in, um, oh, October. So um, uh, Derek and Sally had sent us, uh, residents of Avon Drive had sent us a letter in October 2020 regarding their request um, to have the road bed of Avon Drive moved. I think you guys remember when, and Derek came to a select board meeting, we sent him a letter. Mm -hmm. And um, then recently, Sally has been into the office multiple times and she felt, has felt, she said that GW Tatro, um, and here's some pictures, I'm just gonna share them with you. This says photos taken by A&E prior to construction, and these are the photos I took the other day. So if you guys want to look at them, you can. Um, she, she stated that Tatro had removed rocks from the wall at the base of Avon Drive, and um, that Tim had taken pictures of it, and she talked to them about it. I just got pictures from A&E that they took prior to construction, and then I went and took pictures the other day. And even if you look at the stones, they all, line up and I talked to uh, Mike Maynard a &E, and he said, you know, stone walls in Vermont are very protected. And he said, all contractors and he said engineers know that you give 
um, stone walls like that a wide berth because you don't want to disturb them. So he felt that there was no change, um, that they had not taken any stones or done any damage to that. When you see dug up, um, obviously the snow plow has been up there recently and so torn up a little bit of dirt. But So <clears throat> I had told Sally that I would research it and if in fact that we had done damage to the stone wall, it would be our responsibility and we'd take care of it. But Mike, I sent him the pictures and he, he sent me his and he was like, no, and, and we had not, he felt that we had not damaged it. Um, Obviously, um, so I, I wrote a letter to, to um, Sally and Derek saying that giving her copies of the photos that were taken um, by a &E, the photos I took, um, told her that um, GW Tatro removed stones. She stated they had removed stones from the wall at the entrance. I told her the enclosed photographs show no evidence of that, either in the roadbed or the stone wall itself. Um, and I had also told Sally that Tim Mills may have taken more photos during the water project, but since his untimely passing, I do not have access to those photos even if they exist. Uh, if that changes, I'll happily provide you with copies of any photos he may have taken on Avon Drive near the stone wall. But currently, if you look at the wall and the ground, gee, Tatro didn't disturb that. And um, so today, this morning, I didn't realize, um, she called the town office and spoke to Pam and told Pam that she wanted the select board tonight to walk Avon Drive um, as part of your meeting because Brenda, her neighbor, got more, got hard packed and she didn't, and Brenda got more paving up to the door of her house than she did. But, you know, the project is done and over with and has been. And, you know, we have been through this. The layout of the road hasn't changed. It's a 20-foot road. She has a copy of the road survey where it was laid out. Um, I provide her with photos before and after the project. Um, the select board stated in 20, when she came, when it, Derek came before, that they felt that the matter was closed and that, um, you know, you weren't that um, we had a map created by Sanborn Map Company dated November 1922. It demonstrated that Avon Drive has not gone outside its historic right of way. So, you know, there's just nothing here that's really actionable. And um, it's unfortunate that she feels that way, that the town has taken, you know, property, but the road is the road is the road, and it's been there. And, Certainly, there's no proof whatsoever that Tatro removed any stones from the wall, nor would they have needed to. So, um, I prepared the letter that I left on your table, and we'll give that to <clears throat> to Sally and Derek. And um, you know, I'm not really sure what else to do at this point. Obviously, if there's any damage from the snowplow, um, we'll clean it up in the spring. Look fine by me. I I didn't see any. Um, so I guess issues with it, and I stopped today to look at it, and I, I, oh. and then from the pictures, I can't really tell that there's any difference. Um, yeah, I mean, and there's just and there then sometimes during construction, I mean, we go on one person's property a little more than another, so then maybe someone got a little more material, a little more paving because we disturbed more or something like that, and yeah, and then some of the gripes that mm -hmm. I saw most recently is just some of the things that are associated with winter maintenance. There's some, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, some soils that have been um, disrupted due to yeah. plowing um, and, that will get fixed. And, yeah. and when we went up there too, remember Brenda was on the old line that came up from behind here that went across. Mm -hmm. So her water line even came in from a different direction. So she had to be connected um, because we didn't originally have right. an easement from her. But once we got up there, she changed her mind and wanted to be added to the new system. So, you know, I feel that yeah. Tim managed the project and A&E, we had a construction manager representing us on site. So I, yep. I just, so I'm not sure what we can do. This is not consent. It is not, this is. Oh, no, no, it's, well, it's all typed up in, in her yeah. box, but no, I'm going to call Sally tomorrow. I, I thought she might be in today, but. She... I would take the sentence out that says, if that changes, I will happily. I, you don't well, have Tim's pictures. You just don't have. No, I know, and I did tell her. I mean, you're being I've, nice, but yeah. Well, because I'm also trying to be transparent. If we get yeah. them, I would absolutely share them with her. We don't have anything to hide. So, um, but I can certainly take that sentence out if you'd like. 
Um, I had told her ahead of time that I was going to speak to his widow, um, which I did. And and you know, if and she and Richard get together and get photos, then, then great. We certainly didn't do anything, and I'm happy to share with her what I find. But I can remove that sentence. Um, but yeah, I, don't, um, I don't see anything wrong with it, and it just seems like in this particular case, there's been several instances of things. Yeah. So either yeah. the road had changed, or now the wall, and yeah. then now my neighbor maybe got some more things than I got. And yeah. You just, you know, like yeah. Wow. I, was there something with the eagle as well? Yes. Yeah, the eagle had fallen. Yeah. The, yeah. She. Well, I do believe that that's a true statement because I can certainly. I know Tim well enough to know that he knew where there are areas where there may be friction, and he would have said, you know, we're going to you know, be cognizant and make sure all the neighbors are treated well. And it wouldn't surprise me if Tatro, as one of them had out of consideration, picked up the eagle and laid it on the lawn, which is pretty much what she said they'd done, that they had knocked it over. They'd, and I'm sure, I said, I'm sure they do. You know, they're vibrating the ground. They wouldn't have wanted to damage it. So I would imagine um, we didn't have any complaints of the crew that was on that site. It, Derek himself was at the meeting, and I have it in the minutes, where he thanked them and felt that they did a really good job, you know, Tatro. Yeah. So. No, I, but yeah, I'm sure I they, think he handled it well. I don't, I don't see there's any need for the select board to go up and look at it. But in at this point, no, and, so. and we'll certainly send Morgan up in the spring. We'll send Doug up next. Yeah, <laughs> if it needs to be raked up, It'll be the liaison to Avon yeah. Drive. That's his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so if it needs, <laughs> so if it needs yeah. to be raked or something yeah. needs to be cleaned up, we'll certainly take care of it okay. in the spring, and um, so. All right. Anything else to come before the board? Uh-uh. I'm good. All right. Just need a motion to adjourn. Look at that, Dave. He motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right.